Uh, Scotty, can you? Thanks. All right, for the first talk of the ECHT research seminar this fall, we have Jack Carlisle from Notre Dame talking about isomorphisms of equivariant formal group laws. All right, wonderful. Hi, everybody. Uh, I want to start by, first of all, thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak. I appreciate that very much, and I'm excited to, to talk math with you guys. Um, in order to start, I'm going to go ahead and send a link in the chat to a Jamboard page in case you'd like to visit the Jamboard page yourself. In addition, I'm also going to share my screen so that if you opt not to follow that link, you can still see what I'm writing. So can everybody see the screen that I've written on? All right, I see several thumbs up. I'm assuming maybe that's a, an implicit thumbs up from, from everyone. Okay, cool. Um, so great, today I wanna talk to you guys about isomorphisms of equivariant formal group laws. Um, I wanna mention that a lot of the things I'm discussing today sort of grew out of uh, work with Mark Behrens, And my hope is that this will sort of be a uh, general survey slash invitation to this field, because I think this is an area of mathematics that sort of uh, deserves more attention than it's getting right now. Um, and sort of throughout this talk, I want to mention various uh, perhaps unanswered questions and things that might maybe uh, you may be interested in, in thinking about. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we talk about equivariant formal group laws, let's talk about non-equivariant stuff. And I think I'll start with a definition. Um, so my definition is going to be that of a complex oriented spectrum. So we say a, a spectrum E is complex oriented. Um, if, well, there's a few equivalent conditions, but maybe the one I'll choose is uh, if any time we have a complex vector bundle C over a space X, that we have some sort of natural Tom isomorphism. So this is saying that whenever we take E cohomology of the Tom complex of some complex vector bundle, well, we just get a shift by the dimension of the vector bundle of the cohomology of the base space. Um, so some examples of complex oriented spectra include, well, it really includes all of my favorite ones. Uh, for instance, we have ordinary cohomology HZ, we have complex K theory called KU, and we have a variety of other more interesting examples. For instance, complex cobordism, MU, we have the Brown-Peterson spectrum, BP, et cetera, et cetera. We'll take a look at some of these examples more closely in a little while. Um, a key observation is that if E is complex oriented, Um, then we have a good notion of E-theoretic churn classes for line bundles. So we have a good notion of E-theoretic churn classes. What do I mean by that? Well, the idea is something like this. Um, the universal line, bu line bundle lies over CP infinity. We'll call this line bundle gamma one. And the idea is that uh, if E is complex oriented, then whenever we take the cohomology of CP infinity, this thing is exactly equal to a power series ring on a single generator, which I'll call X. And we can think of X as the first churn class of this tautological line bundle gamma one over CP infinity. Now, since we've defined the first churn class on the universal line bundle, you can sort of define the churn class of an arbitrary line bundle by just pulling back along the classifying map. So in any case, that's sort of the, the key point is that if E is complex oriented, we have churn classes in E cohomology. And an additional observation is that uh, if E is complex oriented, then uh, this cohomology ring has extra structure. It has the structure of what's called a formal group law. Um, so in case you haven't seen this definition before, let me briefly repeat it. 
the definition is that a, uh, a formal group law over some, and I should say this formal group law is over, it's defined over E star, the coefficients of the cohomology theory E. In general, a formal group law um, over some commutative ring K is simply a power series in not one but two variables over K. So it's going to be something that looks like F of X1 and X2 um, lying in K adjoin X1 and X2. And not just any old power series in two variables is a formal group law. We need this power series to satisfy uh, I guess what would be called the co-group axioms or the co-commutative group axioms. Um, so what are these axioms? Well, let me just briefly write them down. The idea is, first of all, if you formally add X and zero or formally add zero and X, you better just get back X. The second one is that this operation needs to be suitably associative. So if we do something like F1 of X or F of X1 and then f of x2, x3. This should be the same power series in three variables as f of f of x1, x2, comma, x3. And finally, the commutativity axiom is exactly that if we sort of swap x1 and x2, we get exactly the same power series. So here, I'm calling these things formal group laws because these are exactly the things that we care about in homotopy theory. Maybe more precisely, we could call these one dimensional commutative formal group laws. Okay, great. Um, so let's turn to the next page of the Jamboard and let's look at a few examples. Okay. Um, so our first example would be ordinary cohomology HZ. Um, HZ is a complex oriented cohomology theory. So it determines a formal group law. And it turns out that this determines the additive formal group law. So the power series associated to HZ is just X1 plus X2. This is telling us that if we know that the churn class of a line bundle is X, or if we know the churn classes of two line bundles, then the churn class of their tensor product is just the sum of the individual churn classes. That's what this is expressing. A slightly more complicated example would be complex K theory. If we look at the formal group law associated to complex K theory, we get what's called the multiplicative formal group law. So this is a formal group law that looks like uh, X1 plus X2 plus a quadratic term. So here I've written V X1, X2, where here V in KU, whoops, V in KU2 is the bot element. Wonderful. These are the two simplest examples to write down. There are, however, some other very interesting examples. For instance, uh, elliptic cohomology gives rise to formal group laws. To be a little more precise, well, the idea is that uh, if you start with an elliptic curve C, then there is a method by which you can construct an, a complex oriented spectrum EC whose formal group law comes from completing the elliptic curve C at the identity element E. So we don't exactly have a clean formula for it, but the idea is that the formal group laws coming from ellipt elliptic cohomology are exactly those which arise from elliptic curves. Let me give one more example. Not zero more, one more, um, which is complex cobordism. Um, so this is the spectrum MU, and the point is that the formal group law associated to MU is the universal formal group law. And so what is this? Well, it looks something like uh, X1 plus X2 plus a bunch of higher order terms 
aij, x1 to the i, x2 to the j. Okay. So these are some examples of complex oriented spectra and the nature of their associated formal group laws. What I want to do now is state a couple of theorems which emphasize the universality or characterize the universality of MU in this setting. I'm going to do this because for the remainder of the talk, I want to take a look at the equivariant version of the story and think about how can we sort of generalize these facts about MU to equivariant MU. So let's write down our, well, it's not ours, maybe it's Quillen's or maybe it's everybody's, depending on how you think about it. Let's write down Quillen's theorem. And Quillen's theorem looks something like this. I mean, it's it can be framed a couple different ways, um, but the way I like to think about it is that uh, ring maps from the coefficients of complex cobordism to a commutative ring K correspond bijectively to, uh, well, maybe I should just write it like this, formal group laws uh, over K. In other words, we're giving sort of a, a description of the functor of points of pi star of MU. We're saying that ring map or pi star of MU sort of represents the functor which assigns to a commutative ring K the collection of all formal group laws over K. Very cool. Um, so we can think of this as our, sort of like as a functor from, uh, well, and yeah, maybe we don't need that formality. Maybe let's just state the other theorem. So maybe this is part one of the theorem. Part two of the theorem is a statement about uh, MU smash MU. So this is like the second tensor power of MU. And what it says is this, um, namely that ring maps from uh, MU smash MU to a commutative ring K correspond to pairs of formal group laws over K over K. Um, so maybe here's our formal group law F, here's our formal group law F prime, and we have an isomorphism between them. And so you can make a more highly structured version of this statement. Uh, more precisely, pi star of MU smash MU is a half algebroid, and so it sort of represents a groupoid valued functor, functor rather than just a set valued functor. And this Part two of this theorem is saying something like the Hopf algebroid pi star of MU smash MU represents the groupoid of formal group laws over K together with their what are called strict isomorphisms. In the context of this talk, I'm just calling them isomorphisms. We're not going to belabor this point. Okay, cool. Um, so in fact, the sort of culmination of this talk will be a proof of an equivariant analog of part two of this theorem. Um, so what I want to do is briefly show you how we can, or just sketch a proof of how we can sort of uh, observe the validity of part two in the non-equivariant setting. And then we're going to dive into the equivariant world and try to understand how automorphisms of equivariant formal group laws behave. Um, so let's do a little bit of a proof sketch of two. Let's try to understand why it's the case that if you have a map from pi star of mu smash mu to k, then you get, in fact, a pair of uh, formal group laws over k together with an isomorphism between them. Um, well, the idea is something like this. Uh, we use the fact that uh, mu enjoys a Tom isomorphism. So if we smash mu with mu, well, we have this zero section map coming from MU smash BU plus. And this is in fact an equivalence of spectrum. And so if we're wondering about what is the homotopy of MU smash MU, um, we can, we've sort of identified this as the MU homology of B. And we know exactly what this is. This is MU star on some generators, which you might want to call B1, B2, B3, 
I happen to have special plans for the later for the letter B later on in this talk. So I'm going to call these elements beta one, beta two, beta three, et cetera. So now let's turn to the next page of the Jamboard. So this is slide number three. And the idea is this. We have uh, two, oh, okay. We have two maps from pi star of mu to pi star of mu smash mu. Um, one is induced by the left unit and one is induced by the right unit. And the point is that uh, an isomorphism between these formal group laws is exactly provided by the power series determined by those elements, beta one, beta two, beta three, et cetera, in the MU homology of B. So in other words, implicitly, I'm using the fact here that isomorphisms of formal group laws are power series. And what I'm saying here is that an isomorphism between the formal group laws specified by the left and right unit is given by, uh, maybe we'll call it y equals x plus beta one x squared plus beta two x cubed, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a strict isomorphism. And so to call this a proof is maybe a little bit fast and loose, but the idea is there. The idea is whenever you uh, look at the homotopy of MU smash U, MU, you get exactly just the homotopy of MU together with these coordinates beta I, which allow you to describe a new coordinate on the universal formal group. So we think of this power series X plus beta one X squared, et cetera, as being sort of the universal automorphism of the universal formal group law. Okay, great. Um, are there any questions or comments about this before we continue on to the equivariant set? I, I have one really naive question. So way back at the very beginning, you defined complex orientation in terms of tome isomorphisms. Yes. In homology. That, yeah, doesn't really, that that's sort of unfamiliar to me. That doesn't sound like it's the standard definition. Is that something like, you know, equivalent to the usual? Yeah, it is equivalent to the usual. And the idea is that if you have um, Tom isomorphisms for the universal vector bundles over BUN, that's actually providing you with maps from the component spaces of the spectrum MU. So that's one way in which you can sort of see that having this data here is equivalent to having a map from MU. Yeah, very nice. So yeah, there's there are other other variations of this definition which can be uh, more useful in other settings. Um, yeah, great. Any other questions or comments before we continue on? Okay. Um, so let's keep moving then. Um, let's take a look at the equivariant setting. Um, and so in the equivariant setting, what I like to say, first of all, is that uh, most of this, and I can be precise if anyone asks such questions throughout the talk, uh, most of this works for a finite abelian group. Uh, for a finite abelian group G. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, though, I'm going to restrict to the group C2 because I think that doing this is going to help us build some intuition about what these equivariant formal groups are, and also we'll be able to see some, uh, some cool calculations and proofs. Um, so we will restrict to G equals C2. Now, I'd like to be a little careful here by specifying the elements of C2. I'm gonna call the identity element of C2 E and I'm gonna call the non-identity non element of C2 G. Um, this is in contrast to another group which is going to play an important role in this story, in, in this story namely the character group C2 hat. So what is C2 hat? 
C2 hat is going to be the group of characters of C2. And I want to give the elements in here names as well. I want to write one for the trivial character of C2, and I want to write sigma for the sign character of C2. Very good. So clearly C2 and C2 hat are isomorphic groups, but they are not the same group. They are not equal to one another. And in fact, we'll see that we sort of have to distinguish between these two in order to really get a comprehensive understanding of what's going on in the C2 equivariant setting. Great. So let's continue on. Um, so we can, our goal is basically to just uh, generalize this story that we've seen in the non-equivariant setting to the C2 equivariant setting. Um, and so we can start by defining the notion of a complex orientation. So let's say a genuine, all of my C2 spectra are going to be genuine here, a genuine C2 spectrum uh, EC2 is complex oriented if any time we have a uh, equivariant complex vector bundle, we'd like an isomorphism of the form cohomology, or whoops, dim C, C, that the cohomology of the of the Tom space of our C2 equivariant vector bundle uh, is just a shift of the cohomology of the base space of our equivariant vector bundle. So this is totally analogous to the definition that we had in the non-equivariant case. Um, so let's turn to the next page. And what I want to do is motivate the definition of a C2 equivariant formal group law. This is sort of a strange algebraic object with which not many of us are familiar. Um, so it's worthwhile to sort of pick apart what exactly is the structure of these things. So um, the idea is we want to define and perhaps understand C2 equivariant formal group laws. Now, what's a C2 equivariant formal group law? Well, it's an algebraic structure which axiomatizes the structure of, of what? Well, it, it, it axiomatizes the structure of the complex oriented cohomology, not of CP infinity, but rather of CP infinity C2. This is the sort of the genuine C2 equivariant version of CP infinity. Um, that's just notation. Let me tell you what it actually is. Um, there's sort of two ways you can think about it. One way to think about it is that uh, CP infinity is the classifying space of BU1 or the classifying space of U1. Um, on the other hand, uh, CP infinity C2 is the classifying space, the sort of C2 equivariant classifying space of U1. And so the idea is that CP infinity C2 is the C2 space, which classifies uh, equivariant line bundles. Okay. So great, in other words, CP infinity C2 carries a tautological vector bundle of gamma. Um, but in fact, the interesting thing, or sort of the deviation from the non-equivariant story, starts with the observation that uh, there's not essentially one line bundle on CP infinity in CP infinity C2, whereas there was essentially one line bundle on CP infinity, namely the tautological line bundle. The idea here is that not only do we have the tautological line bundle over CP infinity C2, we also have something like a twisted tautological line bundle, which I'll call gamma sigma. What is gamma sigma? Well, there's a couple of different ways to define it. Maybe the easiest way would be to 
to say this. So gamma sigma is just obtained by taking the tensor product of two other C2 equivariant line bundles, namely gamma one and the constant line bundle with fiber sigma. So in other words, I'm describing a C2 hat action on CP infinity C2. Since CP infinity C2 represents C2 equivariant line bundles, equivalently what I'm describing is a C2 hat action on the collection of line bund C2 line bundles on any space. The C2 hat action is given by tensoring with the trivial line bundle with fiber sigma. Okay. So now I think I want to go ahead and precisely define a C2 equivariant formal group law. So let's make this definition. Um, a C2 equivariant formal group law consists of some data, which satisfies some properties. Um, formal group law consists of, well, and let's say formal group law over a commutative ring K. So we always have a ground ring K. Uh, it consists of the following data. The main piece of data is R, and this is going to be, uh, well, we're going to think of it as being the C2 cohomology of CP infinity C2. And this is a complete topological K algebra. It is not, however, a power series ring on one generator. Okay, so we have R and we want a co-group structure on R. So what is a co-group structure on R? Well, it's just the thing which is analogous to the structure of a formal group law. It's not a power series ring with which we're dealing anymore, but the point is we should have a map called, uh, well, maybe diagonal or something like that, since it's like a co-multiplication from R to its completer tensor product with itself. So we think about this as sort of being the ring of functions on our equivariant formal group G. And then this is the map, which is sort of like pull back along the multiplication on our equivariant formal group G. Okay, so so far our definition consists of a complete topological K algebra, which has a co-group structure, but isn't necessarily a power series algebra. So right now this could be really anything, um, but the structure will be really pinned down by the next uh, bit of data that I specify. Um, what we want is this. We want a co-group map from R, to the ring of C2 hat valued functions on R uh, or on C or rather K valued functions on C2 hat. So we want a co-group map like this. What is this describing? Well, it's sort of describing that we have a group map from C2 hat to the for equivariant formal group G. So we have a map like this. Formal groups have one K-valued point. It's specified by the vanishing locus of X. C2 equivariant formal groups have two very important K-valued points. They're described by this map, and each one of them has a coordinate. So what I would say is that here we have two k-valued points in our equivariant formal group G, and we want the point corresponding to the identity element of C2 hat to be cut out by a function x in R, and we want the element corresponding to sigma in C2 hat to be cut out by an element x sigma in R. 
So this is our definition of an equivariant formal group. Um, my observation is that it's rather complicated and it's a little bit unnatural. In the non-equivariant setting, we were just working with power series rings, which was great because we could really compute things using for explicit formulas. Here, we can't really do that because it's sort of this more abstract notion of just an, an arbitrary complete topological K algebra, and it has these elements X and X sigma, and it's complete with respect to them, but eh, calculations maybe aren't so easy. Um, and that's sort of a, a main obstruction to proving results in this area because we sort of don't have a great uh, sort of a computational handle on these algebraic objects. So what I wanna do now is um, use the fact that we've restricted to the case that our group of equivariants is C2. And I wanna just examine the universal C2 equivariant formal group. After doing that and understanding it, I'm gonna show you how we can uh, prove this uh, a C2 equivariant analog of this, uh, of the aforementioned result that uh, the homotopy of MU smash MU classifies pairs of, of formal group laws together with an isomorphism between them. So the next thing I wanna do is look at the universal C2 equivariant formal group. Well, yeah, and in fact, before we do that, maybe let me state the theorems about which we care in this setting. So let me go ahead and do that on slide five. Um, so I'm going to give a pair of theorems, uh, just like we did before. Uh, this first part was proved uh, by Hausman and separately, by Kriz and Lu. Hausman used methods from global homotopy theory to prove the result for all compact abelian Lie groups. Kriz and Lu used a more computational appro approach and their method works in the context of a general abelian, uh, finite abelian group. So statement number one is an equivariant analog of statement number one from before, namely ring maps from the C2 equivariant homotopy of MUC2 to a commutative ring K correspond exactly to C2 equivariant formal group laws. Over K. Awesome. So this shows that MUC2 or its coefficients carries the universal C2 equivariant formal group law. Um, this next result, uh, now it's not Jarlin, Carlin, C, um, is one that I'm going to prove using my own sort of calculational method in the C2 equivariant case. Um, and then it was also brought to my attention that uh, this result follows from work of Hausman. So I, spoke to him yesterday. So he posted a paper on the archive two days ago and referenced that he that this sort of follows from his work. So I spoke with him and sure enough, he argued. So yes, he, he used uh, methods from global homotopy theory to prove this result that I'm about to prove in the case of C2. Um, sort of in, in an analogous well, maybe let me just leave it at that. The, the global homotopy theory provides an interesting sort of abstract and formal way to prove results about these objects. Here, I want to take a more calculational approach where we really try to understand uh, equivariant formal groups with respect to just a single group of equivariants. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to the statement, which is that uh, isomorphisms of equivariant formal group laws are represented by uh, MUC2 smash MUC2. So the point is that a ring map like this determines uh, a pair um, of isomorphic equivariant formal group laws. All right, wonderful. 
Um, so cool. So what I want to do for the remainder of the talk is um, provide a proof of part two of this theorem. Um, provide a proof that ring maps out of this MUC2 wedge MUC2 correspond to pairs of iso pairs of equivariant formal group laws together with an isomorphism between them. Um, before we get to that, let's take a look at the universal C2 equivariant formal group law. I think that to do this, to understand what the universal C2 equivariant formal group law looks like is somehow more valuable than understanding sort of the abstract definition of an equivariant formal group law. This is sort of the thing after which the def definition is modeled. So let's take a look at this universal example and try to really understand it properly. After that, we can sort of use our understanding to prove some interesting results. So um, in order to understand uh, the universal C2 equ equivariant formal group law, uh, we are going to use the Tate square associated to a C2 spectrum. So I want to very briefly cover this for those of you maybe who uh, have a little bit less background in equivariant homotopy theory. The idea is something like this. Um, if we have an arbitrary C2 spectrum X, we can sort of break it up into pieces, which depend essentially on non-equivariant data. Um, the idea is we can form a sort of fracture square with respect to an element called the Euler class. So in other words, there's an element A in the equivariant homotopy groups of the equivariant sphere spectrum. And so this element A lives in the homotopy groups of all C2 spectra. Um, we can sort of complete with respect to A, or we can invert the element A. And in fact, our original spectrum XC2 can be recovered as the homotopy, homotopy pullback of this diagram. So in other words, for any C2 spectrum, if you understand its, uh, what are called its homotopy fixed points or homotopy completion and its uh, geometric localization, together with how they're glued together in the uh, Tate construction, then in some sense, in a precise sense, we have a full understanding of the spectrum XC2 itself. So cool. So what I'm going to do is this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a C2 spectrum X, which is going to be the function spectrum from CP infinity C2 to MUC2. And what I'm going to do is just show you what the Tate diagram looks like in this case. Um, up here, we have the cohomology of CP infinity C2. This is exactly the universal C2 equivariant formal group. We desire to understand its homotopy completion and its geometric localization. Let's start with the homotopy completion. A convenient point here is this. Um, so here we're gonna map down to what I might call MUHC2 star CP infinity C2. And one thing that's rather convenient is that in fact, the, uh, the inclusion of uh, CP infinity into CP infinity C2 induces an isomorphism on this homotopy complete equivariant cohomology theory. In other words, we have an isomorphism like this. And so what we end up with is just a power series ring on a single generator. So here I'll call this um, Well, right, we, we have the coefficients of the homotopy completion of MUC2. So this is just the group cohomology of C2 with coefficients in MU star. In other words, this looks like MU star adjoin a variable E modulo the two series of the universal formal group law. And then the fact that we're taking the cohomology of CP infinity means that we're picking up this power series element X. 
Very nice. So here is what the homotopy completion looks like. Let's take a look at the geometric localization and then let's see how these two things uh, glue together. So we're gonna jump over here and the homotopy completion looks like the following thing. It turns out it breaks up into a product of two power series rings. It breaks up into a product that looks something like this. Uh, MU star, we have B naught plus or minus one, we have B1, B2, et cetera. For anyone who's wondering, yes, these are the aforementioned Bs, the ones who uh, sort of stole the letter from the what became betas later on or earlier on. Um, so right, we have this, and in fact, I need to make a little more room. We have a product over C2 hat of MU star adjoin a bunch of coefficients where the first one is a unit and then we have power series and X. These are glued together at the Tate construction. Uh, and perhaps for the sake of time, I wanna skip over what the exact uh, Tate fixed points look like in this case and how they're glued together and instead wanna start explaining sort of how we get to this um, isomorphism result. Um, the only thing I need to say in order to wrap up this section here is that um, just like we had sort of a universal churn class in the non-equivariant setting, we have a universal churn class X in the MUC2 cohomology of CP infinity C2. This is the churn class, the equivariant churn class of the tautological line bundle over CP infinity C2. To specify this element X, is to specify its value at the homotopy completion and the geometric localization. So let me just tell you what X corresponds to in those two places. The answer is that X corresponds to X in the homotopy completion. Wonderful, that's maybe not so surprising. But then over here, X has two components, right? In one of the power series rings, the power series ring corresponding to the trivial character one, we just get exactly the non-equivariant coordinate X, which appears in this formula. However, on the right-hand side, we get this power series, B0 plus B1X, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is the universal coordinate of the universal C2 equivariant formal group law. Somehow it corresponds to just the, uh, the non-equivariant coordinate X in the homotopy completion. And then it has sort of two coordinates, one trivial and one non-trivial in the geometric localization. So this is the universal churn class. And what I wanna do next is spend the last one minute, <laughs> uh, spend the last one minute showing you how we can sort of uh, generalize this non-equivariant calculation to the equivariant set. All right, so last thing is I want to talk about the coefficients of MUC2 smash MUC2. And what I wanna do is observe that this is the same thing as the MUC2 homology of BUC2. And then, uh, analyze the Tate square of this guy right here. Or rather, uh, and in fact, let me just go ahead and do this. Let's look at the homotopy completion. Completion. Let's look at the geometric localization. And let's try to understand what's going on here. Well, the idea is this. Whenever we map down to the homotopy completion, again, we have this nice fact that uh, the value of this homology theory at the homotopy completion depends only on the underlying space of BUC2. In other words, this thing is isomorphic to just the homology of non-equivariant BU, which we know to be a polynomial ring on these elements beta1, beta2, beta3, etc. Over here, on the other hand, the relevant fact is that at the geometric localization, plugging in a C2 space yields the same answer as plugging in its fixed point subspace. So the fixed points 
of this BUC2 guy here are exactly just a copy of BU for each representation of C2, so for each of one and sigma. So let me make my concluding remark here, which is something like this. Uh, the geometric localization will look not like a power series ring in, or not like a polynomial ring in the generator's beta i, but it's sort of like that together with a group algebra, algebra construction. So we sort of have two sum ands here, each one of which has its own generators, beta one, beta two, beta three. Now the theorem that I claimed I was going to prove here is that I would tell you what the universal change of coordinates is for this universal C2 equivariant formal group law. And so let me do it. In order to specify a new coordinate, I need to specify the new coordinate at the homotopy completion and geometric localization in a coherent way. And so I'll do that. Recall that the original homotopy complete coordinate was x. I'm going to replace this with x plus beta 1 x squared, et cetera. Similarly, in the geometric localization, the original coordinate was x comma b of x. And I'm going to simply replace this with x plus beta 1 x squared, et cetera. And then I'm going to replace this with uh, b of x plus sigma beta 1 of x or sigma beta 1 b of x plus sigma beta 2 b of x squared, et cetera. OK, so we had to do a little bit of rushing at the end. Um, but I'd like to sort of conclude by just remarking that uh, these algebraic structures are very complicated. And it, it's sort of a, an open question to understand what exactly is the structure of this ring R, this cohomology of CP infinity A, whenever A is an arbitrary finite abelian group. I've shown you some very explicit formulas and calculations in the case that our group is C2. More generally, uh, not much is understood. Um, so thank you all very much for listening. And I, I encourage you to ask any, uh, any questions you might have. All right, let's thank Jack.